I was bullied. I was made to feel out of place. I don't even feel comfortable seeing myself. So you would check in with me and we would talk and some of the traumas that I had and you helped me release a lot of that baggage. Hello, Yahira. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for being vulnerable today and allowing us to hear your story and really be part of this. I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you for having me, Dr. Fong. I'm so excited, a little nervous, but I'm so ready to talk about this and our journey together. All right. Well, so excited. So um, I want to just get started with our agenda so you guys know what you're looking at. We are going to meet myself and Yahira. So after this, you'll kind of get to know us a little bit better. We're going to explain all of the root causes of eczema that I have really seen in my practice and those that have come up uh, also in Yahira's uh, uh, treatment. We're gonna go through all of her labs and the root causes uh, that we uncovered for her and hear about her experiences. She's gonna talk about her real life experiences with uh, everything that she went through in this journey. And that includes liver dysfunction, digestive dysfunction, autoimmune condition, nasal and allergy issues, hormonal dysfunction, uh, circadian rhythm issues like sleep and fatigue so big with eczema, topical steroid withdrawal, and mental health symptoms. All of these are a part of the eczema case. We cannot take these out of the eczema case. We are one human being, so we're gonna talk about all of those. So let's get down to it. Eczema is such a big problem. It affects 30% of the world's population. That is a very big number, okay? You think about that, 30% of the world's population. And 61% of adults report pain and 5.2% have pain daily. That also is a big number. This is a very painful disease. And for people who don't have eczema, they don't exactly understand how painful this disease can be. So much money is getting poured into this disease. Um, inpatient costs for eczema care reach $8.3 million per year for adults and $3.3 million a year for children. And nearly 5.9 million workdays annually are lost due to eczema. Nearly one third of adults with eczema have experienced challenges in their school or work life. And 14% of adults believe that their academic and or career progression has been hindered by eczema. This is such a big disease and a big problem. And unfortunately, we do not have the answers to this. More than 55% of adults with moderate to severe eczema report inadequate disease control. And what we are gonna be talking about today is disease control is not enough. And we all know that that is why we are here today. We must address the root cause of eczema in order to conquer it for good. So what we're gonna be talking about today with Yahira is how did we address the root cause of her eczema? What were the labs we used? What was the treatment like? What was her experience like? What is the real life experience of really getting down to the root cause? So that's what we're talking about today. I do want to just introduce myself so you guys get to know me a little bit better. Um, I myself had eczema. I was born with eczema. Uh, when I was pregnant with my daughter, that was now, let's see, 15 years ago. Uh, I had topical steroid withdrawal. And actually, I don't have a lot of pictures of myself when I had eczema because I just didn't like to take pictures. And, and we didn't have pictures on our phone back then. And this is actually a real picture that I took a picture of that I took with my sisters when I was pregnant. I'm the one in the middle. And if you look closer, you can see that there is eczema all over my hands. And what you actually can't see is that I'm actually wearing a turtleneck because I have eczema all over my arms and my torso. And actually, the photographer photoshopped out the eczema on my face and my neck, um, but forgot about my hands. So this is one of the only pictures I have with my eczema. And, um, and topical steroid withdrawal, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later, but this is when you're using topical steroids and steroids um, you know, throughout your lifetime for eczema as a band-aid, and then all of a sudden you start to get withdrawal symptoms. So basically I had redness all over my arms and my torso here. Now, I wanted to be a dermatologist. I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley. Uh, I was pre-med. I did research in certain labs. I did an internship with a dermatologist as well too. And unfortunately, I did not find any answers here. And we're gonna talk to Yahira a little bit about her journey um, in going through all the conventional methods. And as you guys probably know, and as you guys are probably going through yourselves. 
and it, I didn't find answers here. So I actually turned to naturopathic medicine when I was pregnant because I was at my wit's end. I was so uncomfortable. I couldn't use the steroid creams. And so I ended up saying, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to go outside of the box. And at that time, you know, naturopathic doctors were not that well known. Um, so I love this quote, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, uh, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. This is what we do as naturopathic doctors. We really get down to the root cause. So we address and, and find those causes. We address the problem and then we get rid of those symptoms. And that is how we really get rid of eczema for good. I love the check engine light analogy. So if you're still not getting that, um, imagine you're driving your car around and the check engine light comes on and then all of a sudden, um, you know, you're like, okay, well, I have to take my car to the mechanic. You take your car to the mechanic. Imagine how you would feel if that mechanic just gave you a cream to put over that check engine light. You would think to yourself, this is ridiculous. You haven't even opened my hood and checked my engine. Well, that is what we are dealing with in conventional medicine. That is what I dealt with. That's what Yahira dealt with. That's probably what a lot of you guys are dealing with as well too, is, um, is you're just putting band-aids over your eczema. So today we are gonna talk about really identifying the root cause and getting down to the root cause, okay? So I finally got my answers. I attended medical school at the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine. I am now the CEO and founder of Clean Body. So welcome. And I would like to now introduce Yahira. So she grew up in San Jose, California. So she's local to me. I'm also in the Bay Area. Her eczema started at five years old and she has tried so many treatments before she saw me, including steroids, the topical injections and pills, supplements, UV light therapy, diets, immunosuppressants, acupuncture, chiropractic, herbalists, homeopathy, hypnosis. And at the time that she started the treatment, she was on Dupixent, which she no longer is on Dupixent. So Yara, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself and tell us about the journey you, you had before you met me? Okay, sure. So like Dr. Fung said, I started getting eczema when I was five years old. Um, it started with like a little patch on my arm. I think I was like in kindergarten. My mom took me to the doctor and of course it was hydrocortisone. They're like, just put a little bit on. Within a few weeks, it should clear up. But within a few weeks, it went away, but then it spread to another area. So my mom took me back. They prescribed another cream. You know, the percentage was a little bit higher this time. And this time, instead of one time to, you know, to apply it, it was twice a day, daily, come back in a few weeks or in a month. And from then on, it was just, that was going to be my journey. Doctor's appointments and pills, ointments, creams. When I was growing up, it was so new. So a lot of the treatments that I did were, I didn't have anybody else to turn to. So I was kind of figuring it out on my own. Uh, like Dr. Fogg mentioned, I did hypnosis, UV light therapies. Um, strict diets, witch doctors, we've done it all. You know, I was really desperate growing up. Um, I felt really alone in my journey. There wasn't a support system and it wasn't on social media like how we see it now. We see a lot of people that are, you know, creating these communities where we can ask one another, like, hey, are you going through this? Or has this happened to you? What, you, what do you suggest I do? Like just for that support, I didn't have that. So I was just figuring this out on my own. I also had, eczema herpeticum which is the picture on the left hand side that was like around i want to say thanksgiving so that was something new a new symptom that i didn't even know could happen and just full body flare-ups um very inconsistent with figuring out what my allergies were finding a treatment that helped it was just a very long journey for myself and i didn't really find any support or help or guidance. I I was desperate to do anything and I did everything. The immunosuppressants, getting my blood checked every week to make sure that my white platelets hadn't dropped, to depict it, you know, injecting myself to get some kind of relief and to ultimately try to manage my skin. So once I got on Dupixent, it cleared up my skin for a few months and I was doing great. And then I started to aggress and I was flaring again. My hair was falling out and I wasn't doing great. 
So that's when I started looking for another option, some, somebody, there had to be something. I was desperate at that point. I was at my lowest point and I was also hesitant to be on Dupixent because like with topical steroids, the doctors, you know, back then didn't tell us long term there was going to be these side effects or topical steroid withdrawal. So I was very hesitant and I didn't trust dermatology because they always brushed me off and the doctors would only see me for five minutes at a time and give me a lotion or a pill. And I I don't remember if it was Instagram or I just Googled it, but somehow I found Dr. Fong. I went on her page, I was reading it and I signed up for her masterclass and everything that she was explaining, it just, it all made sense. It, there was something that just resonated with me and it, it, even though I was hesitant, like I don't want to do another treatment, I don't want to do something new, I, I, you know, this is just another doctor. There was just something that she said that kind of clicked for me that I was like, I need to check this out, look into it. And I reached out to her and we just, we started working together. All right, well, this is where some of her first pictures that she uh, took for us. And um, as you can see, at this point, she's actually on Dupixin. And so as you can see, the Dupixin is just not working. Um, and this is a really common presentation around the mouth and around the eyes. And we're gonna see that around the mouth, often there's a lot of um, gut, gut related issues when we see a lot around the mouth, which Dupixin is eventually not going to touch um, after some time. And so often people who get onto Pixin, you know, after some time it stops working because these root cause problems have not really been addressed. So these were some other pictures when she first started with us as well too. And so we can see when the first time she ever gave us numbers and you can see that eczema does not come alone, especially when you're an adult. It comes with a lot of symptoms and these are all of the symptoms that uh, Yahira was actually tracking for us. And you can see that in the beginning, um, er almost everything was a 10, from eczema to insomnia, to loss of hair, to night sweats. Her body was screaming out for help at this time. And you can see the progress that she made. And, and throughout uh, today's interview, we're gonna see uh, her progress on each of these. So I'm gonna break those out individually and we'll talk about them individually. But I just wanted you to guys get uh, an overall picture of what, what eczema really looks like. It's not just the skin. This goes so much deeper and the deeper places, it's where we really need to focus. We're doing it all wrong in conventional medicine, unfortunately. And you can see that a year later, you know, 12, nine, so about a year later, um, we see that almost everything is a zero, which is so amazing. And, um, you know, about a year and three months later, everything is at a zero. And, and that is clean skin. That is what I call a clean body. Um, this is the, this is the journey. Um, is, you know, it's not a straight line and, and we want to talk about it so that we can really understand that today. Okay. And, um, and we see this, uh, that her eczema, you know, there were ups and downs, but she eventually got to that um, end point of zero. So um, Yahira, do you wanna just talk about just kind of like the amount of symptoms you had and what it felt like and, and a little bit about the beginning of just kind of like what this journey was like? Sure, so in the beginning when Dr. Fong had me go through my symptoms and kind of explain, you know, how I was feeling, it wasn't until I saw the charts and the numbers that I realized I was dealing with a lot of issues. I always assumed that my gut issues were just who I was. Um, the panic attacks was something new. The depression, I had dealt with it my entire life. And even when I was seeing a therapist, you know, they, they didn't say it goes hand in hand with having eczema. It was just, you're just depressed. So a lot of the things I didn't add them up or think that this all goes together and like Dr. Fong said that it was my body giving me all these alarms and you know sounding off these whistles saying like hey something's going on here you need to address all these issues because you know your body isn't at a hundred percent so in the beginning I wasn't sleeping I would rarely go to the restroom I was always constipated my hair was falling out in like chunks like my shower would be clogged because of so much hair loss I was constantly itching. It was just one thing after another. And the panic attacks had gotten to the point where I couldn't even get like drive on the freeway because I was crying or I would start shaking because I was so scared and constantly having like these 
you know, worries and Dr. Funk has it on the, on the chart, but I was, you know, also considering suicide because I've dealt with this since I was five and there was no, there was no light at the end of my tunnel. You know, it was just another day. And I think earlier in the chart, you said like, we deal with pain on day to day. And on top of the pain, you'd have depression. On top of that, your body hurts. You're not sleeping, you're not happy. And slowly, you know, we slowly started to see that my numbers were going down and I started to feel a little bit better. And I started to feel like, you know, I was going to the bathroom more often and my hair wasn't falling out so much. I was actually sleeping, which was huge. I was never sleeping growing up. I've always had insomnia. I was always tossing and turning. I wouldn't go to bed until like two in the morning. So for me to get three nights of consistent deep sleep was huge. I would tell Dr. Fung, I feel like a new person and my skin would respond to that immediately. Like I would see the redness and the inflammation go down just from sleep alone, which was something that I wasn't getting my entire life until we started to address these other issues. Absolutely, and all of these things are tied together. So we need to look at the human body. It's one human body. For us to separate all of these things, um, you know, digestive issues from mental health issues from, uh, you know, circadian rhythm issues, they're all connected is what we really need to see and understand. And I hope that comes across in, in, um, in everything we're going to talk about today. So this was her progress of the eczema, but, but I want to break it down even further because you guys eczema, it's like the peripheral problem. It's the third or fourth or fifth problem. And it's really just the alarm system that makes us go to the doctor, but there are so many many problems before the eczema that we actually need to address. And what you guys are going to see is that the body actually takes care of the core symptoms first. So you're actually going to see like in, in her progression, you're going to see the gut issues get better first and, and the hormonal issues and all of those. And the eczema, unfortunately, is the last thing to get better because it's just the least important thing for the body to take care of, okay? This was amazing because when she first started in December, you know, she was on Dupixin, and then in March, we were able to take her off Dupixin. So tell us about that, because every time you had tried to come off Dupixin before, you had a bunch of symptoms, right? So this time, we were so happy. I remember we were like cheering, and um, mm -hmm. because you were off Dupixin, and it was like a couple weeks, and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't get a flare, which is such a big difference, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, I remember when we were going to start to, or we were deciding, we had gotten to the point where, so on the pictures on the left-hand side, that's how I was looking every single day. Like I was flaring constantly going through this daily. So it wasn't an easy progress or easy journey. So it looks like, you know, three months, it looks like a short time, but I was dealing with this every single day. And the symptoms that we saw previously, that was my daily reminder of what I'm going through. And I had an appointment with Dr. Fong. It was like our follow-up. And I think we were, you and I were talking and you, know, you could tell that something was off and you were telling me like, it's okay if you want to stay on Dupixin or you want to get off because that was the appointment where we were going to decide, do we continue the protocol without Dupixin? Are we okay to get off of it or do you want to stay on it? So I just said, let's just go ahead, rip the bandaid off. Let's just get off of it. And thankfully there were no issues once I got off and I was, I was shocked that what my body responded like that because I saw that other people did have issues. They would go through kind of like a withdrawal from getting off of Dupixin and I was better than when I was on Dupixin at this point. And that was because we started getting those toxins out the right direction. As she mentioned, constipation was an issue. And when you're not pooping, you're not getting rid of your toxins. And so in the beginning, we really started by healing her gut. And we'll talk about that in a second. And we'll show her labs and everything there. Um, but we started to really heal that part of her system. And that's really step one. If you guys are not pooping, this is a big problem. And if you start pooping and you start getting those toxins out your body, you can see that the inflammation really comes down, the body is no longer as inflamed, and those toxins essentially are not trying to leave the body out for your skin. So that's how we were able to take her off Dupixin so quickly. So I do wanna just do a little bit of teaching about, you know, so you guys have a little bit of background in terms of, you know, how do we get to the root cause? Well, again, we've been talking about this already. Your symptoms are just an alarm system. They're just saying, hey, there is a problem internally. 
So I like to say everybody has a detox funnel and that's what this looks like here. On the left is just kind of my depiction of it. Your gut, your liver, your kidney, and something called bile. And this is what it really looks like on the right hand side, okay? And so um, if this works well, we have no symptoms. I mean like no symptoms at all is really how all of us should be feeling all the time. Unfortunately, life gets in the way and so many things can cause this detox funnel to really overflow. Stress is one of them. That's a big one. That's one that we are all dealing with all the time and it just shuts down this entire detox funnel. Genetics, if you look at your family line and you see a lot of people in your family line with a lot of chronic disease, that also can be problematic. Toxins, if you expose yourself to a lot of toxins, this can of course fill your funnel. And lastly, if you have a poor diet and lifestyle. And so when we first met, um, you know, Yahira had a little bit of all of it from all of these departments, right? And we're gonna kind of talk about that as we go through this interview today, but she had a little bit from all of these departments and that is why her funnel was overflowing. And that's also why she was experiencing so many symptoms. As you can see, like when the funnel overflows, First of all, those toxins are gonna try to go out via the skin. You're gonna have aches and pains. It can cause autoimmune disease. It can cause hormonal dysfunction. It can cause gut dysfunction. It can cause mental health dysfunction because the body is basically having a hangover every single day. And that's probably Yahira, how you felt a little bit, right? Like it kind of feels like you're, you're, you're toxic and your body's really trying to overcome that. Is that how it felt? It did, it, it was. I was just always really tired, always in a bad mood. I didn't have energy for anything. Once I started to feel a little bit better and get sleep, like I could just tell the difference in my own energy and even in my mood, like it was, I was just two different people. Like it almost felt like I was like hung over the other version, like always just in a bad mood and you just felt sluggish, I guess is the best word. And you really are hung over. It's really like you're hung over and, you're, and your liver and your gallbladder and all of these organs can't do the job that they really need to do. So bile is very important and it's very, very important for eczema people. So for the most part, almost every eczema person I treat has congested bile, adults and kids. It doesn't matter how old you are uh, because this is a really important kind of stopping point where the funnel gets really congested. And I want you guys to think of bile as kind of like a bus that carries toxins out of the body. And so Yahira's initial labs absolutely show that her bilirubin um, was elevated for me. Now your conventional doctor might look at these labs a little differently. As you can see, this is still within the reference range. Um, however, for me, I like optimally the bilirubin to be between zero and 0 0.4. And just like it sounds, bilirubin has to do with your bile. When your gallbladder is blocked, if you have gallstones, you're not draining properly, your bilirubin levels are gonna build up. I I find this very, very, very frequently in my eczema patients, uh, especially the adults that, that we check. So um, Yahira, tell us a little bit about gallbladder, um, you know, maybe some aches and pains that you used to have in the gallbladder area, which is like um, under your right rib. Tell us about that. That was constant for me. And then I also had brought up to Dr. Fong that like she said um, in the previous chart, how there was toxins, genetics, lifestyle, I had mentioned that my dad had actually, he actually has gallstones. And I remember growing up, I would hear something about his bilirubin and his bilirubin this. So when Dr. Fong brought this to my attention, it kind of all went hand in hand. And I realized that, okay, this is something that was, you know, genetic. I've had it from my dad, which is why mine's elevated, but I always had the pain. I think that when you checked me, when you were tapping, cause you did a full physical, when you were tapping, you were asking you if there was any pain immediately, I had the pain on, you know, on the bottom side when you were, were checking me. So this was one of my issues as well. Yeah. And this is so common. When I had eczema, I would get a cramp on my right side um, all the time. When I would run, when I would exercise, I would get this cramp under my right rib. This is really common for people with eczema. So if any of you guys are experiencing this, um, this could be a problem for you and, and likely is for, for, as I said, almost all of my eczema patients, okay? And you know, what were the potential toxins that might've been clogging her funnel? Well, one, because her dad also has, um, you know, gallbladder issues, it could be one of those is genetic. 
It also could be some of the medications that she had been using, the steroids, et cetera, also could have been stress, diet, lifestyle, all of the above can clog the gallbladder. But we also did find lead and mercury, a little tungsten. So um, not extremely high, but we did find these heavy metals in her system as well too, which is also something that we did end up treating um, towards the end of her care, okay? So I do wanna talk about the gut because in eczema and in Yahira's case, the gut was really, really, really involved. As we said, she had constipation. She also had a little bit of diarrhea, abdominal pain, other symptoms. And you know, how does a, a gut get dysfunctional? Well, there's so many ways um, that we do this to ourselves. Poor diet and lifestyle, stress, toxins, the medications we take can even cause inflammation in our gut lining. And then what happens is the gut gets really leaky and that's what this looks like here is those gut cells actually separate and then anything can leak through from pathogens to foods. And this is often why a lot of people will have food intolerances, food allergies um, as time goes on and as that gut gets more dysfunctional. For anyone with eczema, leaky gut is pretty much an equal sign. Pretty much if you have eczema, you likely have leaky gut as well too. And it's something we can test for. So we did a, a gut test for Yahira and we can see that she had a lot of inflammation. Everything that's red is imbalanced. So she had a lot of inflammation in her gut. She was having malabsorption of fat. She was having low bile acid. So this is where I'm saying this is related to her bile and her liver. And this is very, very, very common for my eczema patients. You're, you don't have enough bile acids. You're not making enough bile. Therefore, you're not exiting those toxins because remember I said um, bile is like a bus that exits those toxins out of your body. Um, she just had a lot of dysfunction as, in the gut as we see here. She had leaky gut and we can see that from the zonulin levels here. And then she also had an intolerance to gluten, which is a really common as well in, in my eczema patients. So gluten and dairy is something I ask people to take out almost across the board because for the most part, I am finding this in all of my eczema patients. So if you are have eczema, you're eating gluten, you're eating dairy, these are things I recommend you take out. Yahira, tell us a little bit about the gut experience for you um, and, um, and removing um, these things from your diet in terms of gluten and dairy. And I know that it's not easy to do, um, right. but you know, tell us about that. So before I started the program, I was always constipated. I always felt heavy and full. Um, and I wasn't going regularly growing up. I always had issues like a digestive issues. So when Dr. Fong, we, you know, we did the labs and she put me on a very, very, very strict diet. Um, there were even fruits that I wasn't eating because I didn't know that certain fruits cause inflammation because of the sugar. So I didn't have any sugar. We didn't do gluten. There was no dairy, no cheese. I wasn't really eating carbs even and certain vegetables I wasn't allowed to eat. She gave me a breakdown of what I was allowed to eat, how often to eat, um, and we also did fasting. And I want to say that was one of the things that I noticed right away a few months into it. We did like a little test. So she told me, okay, have something that has carbs with gluten, like a little cheat meal. As soon as I ate that, it was almost like I ate like a brick. Like it just felt so heavy in my stomach. And I was having a hard time digesting that. And that's when I realized that was like a test for myself that my body thrives on healthier meals. I can't have gluten at all because I see the difference. I feel it in my gut right away. And that's a sign for myself. And once we started doing that specific diet, my gut system started to heal almost immediately. I was going to the bathroom. I went from going maybe like twice a week. I was going every other day. Then I was going daily. I was going twice a day, which was huge. I was somebody who wasn't going regularly. I wasn't bloated anymore, which was another thing that I always struggled with. No matter what I ate, I immediately felt bloated and like my stomach would be making like all those weird noises that all went away too. So the diet was something that helped me almost immediately and you could see in my chart like everything started to improve and it started to drop within months. And we can see things like abdominal pain, nausea, belching and gas, diarrhea, constipation. You can see all of those dropped immediately when she started to change things. You see some spikes here and those some of those spikes are actually due to stress. Uh, that mm -hmm. she was going through. And then also some of them are due to some die-off symptoms. 
because if we go back here, we can actually see that she has a lot of what we call dysbiosis. And so as you can see, she has some bacteria that are overgrowing. She has some bacteria that are low, some very important beneficial probiotic organisms are low. And so we needed to also fix that problem. And so as we're fixing that problem, we're, we're also dealing with some um, die-off symptoms as, as we're going there. So that's why you see this initial improvement in her gut symptoms. And then you see some spikes around um, like March or so, uh, because we see a spike there because we're, we're doing um, some protocols there. And then she also, I think, brought in some foods. I think you were moving at that time, Yahira, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, was. There was a lot yeah. of stress during that time. And so we see a little bit of a spike there. And then, you know, this is a learning process when you start to learn, okay, um, I really can't eat gluten. And I, mm -hmm. I tried again because I was moving and I was stressed and all of that. And so I tried eating those foods, which is what, what yeah, I would run through. And it's really amazing. You can actually just see how everything here is really correlated. You know, what are the other associated conditions? And eczema in adults is associated with other serious chronic conditions. And this is, this is, makes sense because this is just an alarm system telling us there's a really big problem underneath and you can really find that um, when we don't fix this problem other things can happen like diabetes obesity autoimmune disease high blood pressure heart disease risk really increases with eczema severity and in yahira's initial labs we did see that she was positive for autoimmune an autoimmune marker called ana and what this means is that the body is basically attacking itself and now this isn't true of every eczema case but the more severe your case is the more there is a possibility that you uh you are having an autoimmune condition and you know what is an autoimmune condition well usually it's something that is kind of being triggered in your system and it's tr being triggered incorrectly so our body really creates this uh kind of um you know mounts a defense when there's any invaders in our body and when we have a lot of invaders like microbes or bad foods like gluten and and, and dairy and i would call those more inflammatory foods that our bodies don't like or um, you know, toxins like heavy metals and plastics and things like that, these kind of invaders can actually um, cause an autoimmune condition. So this is really common in very severe cases like Yahira. Um, so not everybody has this, but this can be something that we do find. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of people, when they come to me, they're like, oh, I was told autoimmune disease is just genetic and, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Just take a medication and that's it. Well, 30% of autoimmune disease is genetic, but what we find is that 70% of all autoimmune diseases are actually due to environmental factors, including toxic chemicals, dietary components, gut dysbiosis, and infections. So when we think about what was triggering Yahira's um, autoimmune condition, it was all of these factors because we know that now because that autoimmune condition is gone right? And her eczema is clear. And so we know that it was all those things. And that's why doing all those things and really putting that work in really, and, and Yahira is the one to really congratulate here is like, you did, you did this, you did a great job to reverse all of this for you. And then there were other labs that we had that indicated a lot of inflammation. So common eosinophil count is elevated as well for um, eczema patients. This can often be due to the microbiome imbalances. Sometimes people have parasites and other things that are triggering this. And then her vitamin D is another immune marker that was just really low. And so one of the things I wanted Yahira to do was like get out in the sun and just do these natural things that we don't usually do. Tell us about that, Yahira, some of the lifestyle things that I asked you to do. In the beginning, it wasn't a lot of exercising because I had a lot of cuts and irritation. So I was doing a lot of walks. I think it's rebound jumping that you had me do where I was jumping up and down just to get my lymphatic system moving. Once my skin started to improve a little bit, I was doing dry brushing. Let's see, we did uh, colonics, saunas. Oh, one of my favorites was the IV therapy, which I'm still doing. I'm obsessed with that. So I still do the IV therapy, like the Myers cocktail, glutathione. But even the basic things like getting up earlier, um, there was like this cocktail that you would make us drink in the mornings, which it was like lemon, um, olive oil, water, and on an empty stomach and drink that to kind of help our digestive system, our liver. 
and really be outside. So that was when I was doing my journal entries with you and I was just recording myself talking and going outside and, you know, getting some sun because I wasn't doing that. I was always covered up. I was wearing long sleeves and sweaters, so I wasn't getting any sun or I was staying indoors. So just the small changes that we were doing was ultimately what helped me towards the end. Yeah. And you know what's funny? It's like being healthy is really just doing things we should be doing if we were living out in nature. If we were living out in nature, we would be exposed to the sun. We would be, uh, you know, gathering our food. We would be gathering whole food instead of processed food. Uh, you know, we would be moving our bodies. We would be laughing and, you know, et cetera. All of these things, they're, they're, it, it's just plain and simple in terms of actually getting to the root cause. It's actually doing the things we're supposed to be doing. But in today's world, in today's society, it's just not what we do. And so what I want to show you here is it's not just about taking vitamin D. It's about going outside in the sun and actually getting that exposure so that your body can make the vitamin D. And um, there are studies that show that vitamin D, um, low vitamin D can be linked to atopic eczema. And you know, one thing you guys can do is just go out in the sun. Even UV therapy is actually a conventional treatment for eczema. And what is that? That is UV that can be from the sun. So if you just go out in the sun and get some exposure, this can also be a treatment for you. So it's not just you know the supplements or the, the treatments, um, but it's also just doing the things we are supposed to be doing. And that's also the education and, and the, the work that Yahira did and, and continues to do now. We'll talk about that in a bit, is just kind of like, what does maintenance look like? Will you continue to do these things to really make sure that your body stays clean? So one in three children with eczema will additionally develop asthma or allergic rhinitis. The risk of developing asthma increases with eczema severity as more than 50% of children with severe e eczema will develop asthma. And that is, it just makes sense because we're not cleaning up the system. So the lungs are the next place that this is gonna um, cause some problems. Young children with eczema are six times more likely to develop a food allergy compared to children without eczema. And that is likely because of the leakiness of the gut, the inflammation that's happening, that immune system is attacking itself, etc. And so these were some of Yahira's um, allergy and nasal symptoms at the beginning. She was getting a lot of nosebleeds, which as you can see, actually dropped very quickly in the process. Her seasonal allergies, which again, we see this bump up in March, um, April, May, June, July. That's when she moved and, and actually uh, was having just a, a, some increase in symptoms because of stress. And then she was going outside of our, our um, diet and all of that. And then post nasal drip, and you can see the same thing going on here. So Yahira, tell us a little bit about these allergy symptoms um, and, and the journey that you took here. So in the beginning, growing up, I was always on, it was either Zyrtec or Claritin, um, nasal sprays. So in the beginning, I was struggling with that. And, you know, I was always carrying around my tissues because I was, you know, dealing with a runny nose and itchy, watery eyes. And also, like you had mentioned, growing up, I also had asthma and that thankfully had gone away. But my allergy symptoms were always a high. Um, I dealt with hives a lot. So once we started to work together and kind of address everything, I did see everything start to to decrease and it was during the move because I was moving from one location to another. It was a different area, I was out and about, wasn't eating the way I was supposed to. And that's kind of like when my seasonal allergies were up and it was around that time too, April, May, even March where, you know, allergies for me would usually act up allergy season. And after that, like once I got settled back um, and started doing the routine again, that's when I noticed that everything was kind of falling back into place and my allergies calmed down and no more nosebleeds, which was something that I was waking up with almost probably like two, three times per week. So after that, I was good to go. Awesome. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting to see this and to see it broken down like this because, um, you know, she she got like immediately a lot of these things got better, um, but we really weren't done. And, and she was at the point where like, she really had to keep that strict diet and all of that because her body was still in the process of healing. 
And um, you know, now she's at a point more where she doesn't need to be as strict, but she still does maintain a quite healthy lifestyle that she's learned. Um, but because her body is really kind of clean and, and operating really optimally now, um, you know, there aren't as many ups and downs for her. Um, and, and she also knows the things that she can and can't do in terms of like what's healthy for her, what's poisonous for her. And gluten, for example, is something that's going to be poisonous for her probably for the rest of her life. And so she knows to stay away from it. Okay. So next, what we're going to go into is the circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm is like basically we have cortisol that wakes us up in the morning. And usually, again, it actually gets stimulated by the sun. So when we go out in the morning, actually our cortisol levels come up. Um, and it drops throughout the day so that at night it actually drops to really low and then we're able to go to sleep. And what you can see here is her, her cortisol was really low um, in the mornings and then it was a little bit higher as the day went on, which is, which is really common in an eczema case as well too, especially someone with topical steroid withdrawal because um, the, the steroids actually affect this uh, circadian rhythm. And you can see that the normal stress response, uh, what that looks like, and when you have a lot of chronic stress, how much this can really affect, you know, uh, the response of cortisol. And you'll get cortisol resistance, um, which is a, a part of actually the, the topical steroid withdrawal. And hydrocortisones and other type of steroids, those are, that, those are steroids. So basically they actually mimic cortisol. And uh, this is how we can get what's called red skin syndrome or topical steroid withdrawal is because the body is basically waiting for that to, to be present and your body stops making it. And so that's why you have withdrawal symptoms. And there are, you know, a, a, there's a bunch of research that shows this, but not a lot of dermatologists actually recognize it or even like treat it because they don't really understand it. And it's really something that's just coming, you know, actually social media is what's making this more prominent now because people are saying, Hey, I think this is what I have. And there really is steroid withdrawal. And this is what Yahira was going through when we first met actually. And that was affecting her sleep. Uh, and this is seen so much in eczema, in the eczema process. The sleep disturbance occurs in approximately 60% of children with eczema and 15 to 30% of adults, um, and it, this includes insomnia, fatigue, um, and and this can be really problematic. Part of it might be because you guys are so itchy, but the second part is that the hormones are all in balance as well too. So this was her profile for her circadian rhythm and her journey. Um, she was, um, ha you know, having a lot of fatigue, and as you can see, is that got really better pretty quickly, and then again, she has these ups and downs, and then zeros towards towards the end. And then insomnia was the same thing is, um, you know, she was at tens all the time in the beginning here. Um, so yeah, Hira, tell us about this, about how sleep was so difficult for you. I know that was one of actually the biggest things when we first, you just couldn't sleep. So tell us about this journey for you. It was just really frustrating, just, you know, not being able to just sleep at night. I just felt like something was wrong with me because this is supposed to be the easiest thing to do. You just close your eyes and go to sleep. but. I couldn't fall asleep, I couldn't stay asleep, I was uncomfortable, I was itchy. So not just like the physical aspect where like I'm shaking off the bed because I can feel my skin, like my dead skin and I'm shaking it off, or like I was scratching so much where I was bleeding and I'm trying to put lotion on it, but I was just wide awake. Like during the day I'm exhausted and I'm tired and I have no energy. My mood is completely, you know, at, at the worst. I was just angry depressed feeling sad and exhausted all day mentally like i couldn't keep up because i was just checked out and at night there i am struggling to sleep tossing turning i would go to the couch to try to sleep there because you know i'm keeping my partner up from sleeping because i can't get comfortable and insomnia was something that i struggled with my entire life like i've never had good sleep so once we started to get some days where I was sleeping more, like it was just a huge, huge relief for me. And I was so happy with that. Like I was still flaring. I still had all these issues, but just to be able to sleep and like sleep an entire night was a huge win for me. And I was so happy. I was like, okay, we're getting somewhere. And that, that really helped me. Like it gave me enough energy for the next day to actually do the things that I needed to do. So, you know, 
I slept, I feel rested, I had energy to eat healthy, go for like a 15, 20 minute walk, do some meditation, do something that's good for me, take my supplements. So it just, it made a huge difference in just my overall, I guess like the way I was thinking for the next day, like it, it just, it made a huge impact. And what do you think is the biggest factor in what, what helped you to sleep, do you think? I don't know if it was something that, like the diet or what it was, but I eventually, I was actually tired at night. Like I was actually able to fall asleep. I wasn't, um, you know, I was still kind of flaring, but I was actually tired. I was actually to fall asleep and stay asleep. So I don't know. And I think it's really interesting and, and we don't always recognize this, but our kind of mind gut connection is so strong. So if our gut isn't working well, we are not gonna sleep. We're gonna have anxiety. We're gonna have all these mental health um, symptoms if we're not pooping and, and our gut is so inflamed. And so yes, just by changing your diet and by giving you some supplements to kind of heal the gut lining, um, your neurotransmitters and your hormones all start to balance. And then you were doing so much. I mean, I mean, you were doing everything I asked you to do from going outside to meditating and breathing and there's so much you were doing and and sleep is really a sign of health if you guys are having a hard time sleeping then there are diet and lifestyle things that can change this absolutely but they're sometimes not the things that you would think of they're they're right. they seem unrelated but they're completely related the other problem is that when you're stressed out or when you have cortisol issues and you're taking hydrocortisones and things like that is is not just the circadian rhythm stuff but it also affects all your sex hormones so your female hormones your male hormones so things like estrogen testosterone and progesterone and so when we first started um, she was having a lot of hormonal symptoms painful menses cramps um, you know, during her period, night sweats, PMS, excessive flow, loss of hair and balding. So tell me about this. Tell me about this progression because for a female, these hormonal symptoms are really a sign that everything is in balance. And then when that starts to heal, we know that we're really getting somewhere. We know that the core of the system is improving and all those hormones are starting to balance. Tell, tell us about this. So for me, in the beginning, when I would get my periods, um, I was fine. And I want to say it was around maybe 2016, probably a little bit before I had gotten on to Pixent. That's when I started to notice that my periods were changing and they were getting very, very heavy. Um, I wasn't a person that had heavy periods before. They were usually regular. But at this point, I was uh, heavy periods. The cramps were unbearable. I was taking like 800, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. Um, very nauseous when it was time for me to get my period. I was extremely nauseated, dealing with back pain. My hair was falling out. And for the night sweats, I, I want to say I was like drenched at that time. Like I would wake up and my pajamas were wet. My, my bed was wet from just sweating at night. And um, when I was tracking my period, I remember it was, I think I had an appointment with Dr. Fong. And that's when I realized that I had put zero for pain. Like. I had no cramping and that was the first time where I had like an actual period where there were no symptoms. Like I I wasn't in pain, I wasn't bloated, I wasn't, you know, nauseous, my hair had you know wasn't falling out anymore. Like it was bearable. I, I, I didn't even feel like I was on my period. I felt great, which was huge. So the progress was, you know, you can see from my chart, it it started to improve almost maybe like within five months, six months and only when there was stress that it would kind of pick up again, but I hadn't gotten it back to a 10. Yeah, I think sometimes women don't know this, but women should not have really symptoms during your period. Um, currently, like, I, I don't even know my period's coming, it comes and then it goes and it's like nothing, you know? And so I think often women think, oh, the period is, is supposed to have all these symptoms, that's just normal. And it's not normal. It actually indicates that there's an imbalance in the hormonal system. 
And so um, it really is for me, one of the really clear signs that someone's body really is starting to heal. And we can see the same thing here. We can see that like things got better immediately. And then during that stressful time, everything picked up and then it all came back down. So that's really wonderful. And, and that is a really big sign when we're treating that everything is really moving in the right direction. I want to move on to the mental health piece. And I want to end here actually, um, because the mental health piece is so, so big in an eczema case and it is not talked about enough at all, really. And so here is some data. Adults with eczema have a two and a half to three fold higher risk for anxiety, depression, um, that increases with the disease severity, yet up to one half of individuals may go undiagnosed. This is a big problem. Recent studies have suggested people with eczema are up to 44% more likely to exhibit suicidal ideation, and 36% are more likely to attempt suicide. More than one third of people with eczema say they often or always feel angry or embarrassed by their appearance due to the disease. One third to one half of adults with eczema avoid social interactions because of their appearance. Children, adolescents, and young adults with eczema often feel isolated from their peers due to disease related lifestyle restrictions. And this one is really scary. One in four children and teens with eczema have experienced bullying because of their disease. So I wanted to just kind of get your your response to those numbers, uh, to, to that data. Yeah, Hira, tell me your response to that. Um, okay, so since I've had eczema since I was five, I, I resonate with everything. Like I was bullied, I was made to feel out of place. And um, growing up, I did miss out on a lot of first experiences because I would cancel or I would tell them like, oh, I can't make it, I'm sick, or I'm not feeling well because I was embarrassed of how I looked. And I was always hiding the fact that I had eczema. Like if I met people, I didn't want to meet people when my skin was bad or when I couldn't hide my flare ups. And that was something that I don't feel that doctors acknowledged or supported me. It was always, uh, you know, this patient is dealing with eczema. This is how their skin looks. I was never addressed to as a person or checked into, and you know, just to see how am I doing, how am I feeling? And with Dr. Fong, like with you, one of the things that I really appreciated is that you always made me feel like a person and you always checked in with me. Like you could tell when my emotions were kind of low and when I was, you know, because the program wasn't easy and it, it was hard to to manage without having like a good support system. Like I had friends and family, but it, it's still something that's really hard. And unless somebody's going through it, like nobody really understands you. And Dr. Fong having eczema, like she knew, like, I think I had told you, like when I brush my teeth, I don't do it in the bathroom. I do it somewhere else where there isn't a mirror or I turn off the lights. I would shower without the lights on because I don't even feel comfortable seeing myself. So you would, you know, check in with me and we would talk and, you know, talk about some of the traumas that I had and you helped me release a lot of that baggage. And even now, like you said, like this is maintenance. There was times where I fell off of the program because of my mental health, because this is, it's something that I'm still dealing with. Like, even though, you know, my eczema has gotten to the point where I can say like, oh, you know, I'm a hundred percent better. I have like little flare ups or allergic reactions. I still get like that fear. Like I'm, I'm traumatized from topical steroid withdrawal, from eczema itself, everything that the moment that I see a little pink, a little redness, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go back to the, the time where I was bedridden for a year. Like my eczema is gonna come back. I'm, I'm scared of it. And this is something that I think even recently they said, oh, you know, if you have eczema, you do deal with these ideations of suicide and that was where I was at when I got on Dupixent. Um, it was either I get on Dupixent, even though I, I don't know the long-term effects of it, or I'm not gonna be here. So it was kind of like, you pick and choose what you wanna deal with at that point. And uh, I guess, I, you know, I didn't wanna give up. So I, I got on Dupixent and thankfully, it gave me a little bit more time to meet Dr. Fong and go through this. But, you know, I'm glad that you brought up mental health because it's huge. It, it has impacted me in every single way. And 
relationships, life, you know, dealing with anger because you feel like you miss out a lot in life and uh, you're still dealing with all these emotions and learning how to process it. And uh, once you get to the other part of healing, you're not just joyful, but you're also learning how to process what you were suppressing for such a long time because you were, you know, flight or fight and you're just trying to keep yourself alive and dealing with your skin that you're not really processing everything that you're missing out on and all, you know this constant trauma that you're dealing with every single day it's it's a lot to to process in that time so now I feel like I'm at a point where I'm learning how to unpack all of this and really heal as a whole not just you know now that my skin's better but working on my mental health yeah and it, it's a forever journey the learning how to not carry the baggage learning how to unload it and in the process of working together we identified what those pieces of baggage were and they would come up you know and anytime you would have a little bit of a flare they would come up and they would kind of like they would flare up too and all of your fears would come to the surface and so we did what i call the clean mind protocol where we identify what the trauma is, we identify what the emotion is, we look at it, we really like pay attention to it. I have you breathe through it and really almost like meditate about it and then process it, right? And 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 hopefully you take in those tools and you continue to use them now. So tell us about that process of of honing in on the traumas processing them and then just kind of letting them go. Tell us about how that worked for you and how you continue to maybe do that now. So when we would do these, um, you know, it was during our interview, we were doing it like this through Zoom. And, you know, we were kind of trying to figure out, well, what kind of emotion am I feeling or what's going on? Is it anger, resentment? embarrassment, sadness. And once we figured out what the emotion was and what kind of memory was associated with it, we kind of talked about it. And, you know, I just kind of sat with the feeling for a moment, breathing through it. And towards the end, once we were, we were done that I would learn to like really release the emotion. And it was kind of like, not like an exhale, but almost like a yell, like to, to yell it out of your body. I, I just felt, I felt a little tired but I felt relieved. I felt like I had let it go. And even now I pay more attention to my emotions and how I'm feeling because I know that for me, stress and my emotions are huge triggers. So this is something that I'm constantly paying attention to. And I think back about what you told me to do and you know, deep breathing really does help me. It, it helps bring me back, it, it centers me and I have to kind of pull myself from going down this spiral and just going out of control i have to you know remember this is what i used to do this is how it helps so it's just learning how to sit with your emotions and those traumas and you know take your time processing them because at times it was just one emotion and we would be on you know on zoom for like 30 minutes dealing and talking about it and learning how to let go of that trauma and that that feeling that i was holding on to this was your journey for mental health um, starting with panic attacks in the beginning you were you know you were considering suicide just feeling like there was no answers there and feeling like you can't live like this um, crying often feeling depressed worrying a lot feeling high strung and as we can see we kind of cleared a lot of that um, in the first four months or so that was a journey for us is is really working through that and and it didn't feel fun going through that and really looking at those emotions like it's not a fun process right but tell us about because i think it's so amazing like when we first started i know i think you had to quit your job and you know you were really at like the final straw almost and like tell us where you are now because you just told me some really awesome information <laughs> and tell us like i know that at, at some point in the middle here you got a job and like and like you just started restoring your life and and it's such a big deal like all all of it in terms of having eczema and all the emotional stuff and then it's starting to unload and then you actually feeling like you can live your life tell us about that yeah so when i met you i was at my lowest like i said uh getting on dupixent was you know i do see it as you know like i guess like a saving grace it, it was something it was something that i had to do to eventually find dr fong 
and I was at my low. Like I had, I'm originally from, you know, Santa Clara, the Bay Area. I had moved to LA, I'm in LA now, and it was a huge change. You know, you're moving from your comfort, no friends, no family. So it was a lot that I was dealing with at that time and working at a job where I was completely unhappy, dealing with panic attacks, depressed, my skin was getting worse, got into Pixin, I was gaining weight. And yeah, that was like just such a dark time for me. Like I wasn't really sure when it was going to get better. You know, I, re I remember being 15, 14 thinking, even at that time, like I, I don't wanna be 30 or 40 years old still dealing with this. Like I, I can't deal with this anymore. Like I'm tired of dealing with this every single day like it is tiring it's exhausting just just trying to survive another day you know once i started to feel a little bit better my skin was improving i was losing weight like i could feel like we're getting somewhere like this is you know this might be it for me because in the beginning like i was so nervous i, I wasn't sure i was just trusting dr fong like this is what she's telling me to do I've done it all, you know, I don't have anything to lose at this point, so let me just put everything into this, no matter how hard it is and how much I might cry during the the program. And eventually, you know, I wasn't crying anymore. I wasn't having panic attacks in the morning, at night, every day. Now I'm able to drive on the freeway, which is something that I wasn't doing before. You know, I feel like where I'm at now, if I would have known in the beginning of the program, like I wouldn't even believe it. Like I started going to school. I was, you know, I went back to the university. I was, you know, doing that because I was like, this is something that I didn't get to do before. I left the job that I hated. I started working something somewhere else. I feel like now I'm able to discover who I am. Like it's no longer Yahaira and her eczema or how's her eczema doing? Like and now it's me. Like I'm getting to learn what do I like? What do I want to do with my life? And even though there's times where like I get mad and sad because I feel like I missed out and like I didn't get to become the person that I wanted to be, like I wanted to be a nurse, I keep thinking like I'm just gonna, you know, pivot and find what works for me now and make the best of my situation now. And I'm just so thankful to be where I'm at now. I'm sleeping, feeling great, not dealing with these flare ups and just happy like i'm actually happy and the big news like i got engaged <laughs> you know it was something that <laughs> something that i didn't think was ever gonna happen like i you know i was like who's gonna want to be with somebody who has eczema when they can have somebody that's normal like so it's just i don't know like i'm just very happy to be where i'm at now and i'm very thankful for dr fong so yeah <laughs> and and you know I was I was your partner in this journey, but you really did all the work, and so I think it's um, it's such a big pat on the back to yourself as like you got yourself here, you did all the hard work, and um, you know it's not easy to be vulnerable with yourself and to be vulnerable with all of us here today. Um, I think it's such an amazing thing to share your story and so um, inspiring for people who are here. So inspiring. And I feel the exact same way. I, When you say these things, I'm like, oh, I, I know how you feel and I know where I'm at as well, too. And it's such this amazing, amazing place to be because you just think you would have, you never, like if we went back and even for myself, if I went back to when I had eczema, like, no way am I living the life yeah. I'm living now. Um, it's so amazing. So um, thank you so much for sharing uh, your journey, for really being vulnerable with us and your journey to having a clean body. And, and what is a clean body? It's one that's symptom free. It's functioning optimally, not just free of disease. And that's so, that's so important. Our doctors are really only paying attention to do we have a disease they're not trying to say are you functioning the most optimal you can you can function and that's what we're trying to do we want to get you to that optimal optimal place and where you don't need medications or even supplements and so right now i don't even think yeah are you taking any supplements right now i don't even know if you're if you're taking i'm not anything. The only yeah. thing that I, I, I still do is because I love it. Is I love doing the IV therapies and like yeah. making sure I still yeah. take glutathione because yeah. it's yeah. Work, it works well for me. But yeah, yeah. And that's something you can do. How often are you doing it now? Like every two weeks or every four weeks or 
Every I, month. It was every three weeks. Okay. So you're yeah, doing before it was every oh, three yeah. weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and that's, that's her maintenance, right? And so everybody has a different maintenance but you shouldn't need supplements at the end. You might do it because you feel great. And IVs are awesome for like anti-aging and just making sure the body is, is continuing to function really well. But she wouldn't need that. You wouldn't need that because you've come to a place where your body is clean and therefore your skin is clean. And that's really what I wanna get across in, in your journey and, and everyone's journey really to to achieving um, clean skin and, and eczema-free skin is, is um, it, it can be a journey because we have to really check off all those boxes from your gut to your liver, to your gallbladder, your hormones, your mental health. It's not just giving you one thing and then the skin stuff goes away. So I'm just so thankful for you for sharing this story because um, I share my story about this all the time, but to hear someone um, you know, other than myself really go through this and really share it. It's just so empowering for all of us. So thank you so much, Yahira, for sharing. So I want to end for Yahira on this. Like, this was the journey. Um, Yahira, what do you have just kind of, what do you want to end with for people who are here and they're suffering? They're in the place where you were at the beginning of this, like a 10 out of 10, um, and maybe at the same place where it's like no answers, they're at their wit's end, they just don't know what to do. What What would you want to have been told to you? Um, like, what do you have to say to these people to just kind of inspire them and let them know there is that light at the end of the tunnel and you have achieved it? I would just say, keep trying, don't stop. Um, find what, what resonates with you and what like makes something that gives like your gut, like trust your gut instinct, that was, me with Dr. Fong because in the beginning on your website there weren't a lot of pictures and there wasn't like anybody on Instagram that I could reach out to like hey I saw that you did Dr. Fong's program does it really work you know so trust your gut do your research that's the best advice I could give because we've all like anybody that has eczema we've all tried every doctor every therapy every medicine and like for me personally I was tired of doing them like when somebody would refer me to a dermatologist or have you tried doing this? Have, I was tired of it. I was annoyed. Like, don't tell me anything to do or like, don't, you know, refer me to your doctor because you're just done with it at that point. So all I can really say is just don't stop. Um, I feel like where we're at now, at least from what I've seen on social media, we're, we're seeing more, like we're seeing more people heal from eczema. We are seeing that, hey, we don't have to be on steroids, on lotions, on all these insane treatments. Like we can actually heal our bodies naturally and find the root cause and find all the other issues because I didn't think that you were going to address like my gut issues. I thought, okay, like I might have, you know, my eczema might clear up and I might still have, to, you know, to deal with all the digestive issues and you helped me with that or that you were going to address my mental health too. So... You know, I would just say keep trying, but you know, it's, it's not anything inspirational, but I would just don't give up hope, keep trying. Um, hopefully seeing my story help somebody just, you know, to see that somebody did this and you can see the before and the afters and, you know, give somebody a sense of reassurance that this works. Absolutely. And I think even just that, because sometimes it's like, we don't really believe that something can be an answer. And then I think the journey is not, if we look at this journey, right? And we look at your eczema, and if we just look at the eczema, we see, okay, things started getting better, but then you have a spike. And I think that sometimes when we're going through this journey and we have that spike, we think, oh my gosh, we're going backwards. Mm -hmm. But I wanna show you guys this. I, I wanna show you this journey because this journey is not a straight line, unfortunately. And as you're getting better, you can see that she's trending better the entire time, but it's a bumpy road. And it's bumpy because we uncover, and it's like you're peeling away at an onion. And we first get the first layer, and okay, things get better. But then a new layer appears, and now we have to deal with that, and now we have another bump. And then a new layer and a new layer and a new layer. But as you can see, she's constantly trending downward. And this is the journey. And I want to really highlight this because when I work with people and, and they're getting better and then all of a sudden they have a spike, it's like, oh no, I'm, I'm regressing. And I know that's the fear. That that's what Yahira mentioned earlier. It's the fear that kind of comes up because you guys have dealt with this for so long. But 
in the journey to really heal from the inside out, we sometimes have to have some of these bumps in the road. Looking back, Yahira, what would you say? Like when I look back at my journey, I, I understood all my bumps. Like I could understand why mm. I had them. I can understand, okay, so I was uh, killing off candida yeast mold at that time. I could understand my bump. Oh, I, I had so much stress because of X, Y, and Z. I understand my bump. Do you look back and now do you see your bumps and do you kind of now understand them? But but to also talk about when it was happening, you were like, oh no, it's all coming back. I'm never gonna get better. <laughs> like all the stuff that would happen in that process. Yeah, I think one of the, the first bumps that you mentioned was our move when we moved from our last place to where we're at now. For me, I have a hard time remembering like all the data, everything that I've learned and I kind of go more emotional, so I freak out. But when we moved, all the dust, I'm allergic to dust, um, all the pollen because we moved during allergy season. We didn't have a fridge, you know, we moved during pandemic. So everything was backed up. Like we didn't have a lot of furniture. We didn't have a refrigerator. We were eating out. I wasn't exercising my job. It was so stressful. So it was all of the things that are triggers for me were all piled into this night, you know, nice little package for me. And that's where we had our flare up. And I told Dr. Fogg, I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? I did something wrong. It's coming back. Like it stopped working. I was freaking out. And now when I see my patterns, I realize like, okay, it's stress, I'm not eating well. A little while after that, I was working at another place and the same thing, it was a horrible environment, so stressful. And I told Dr. Fong, like, I have to be honest, I haven't been eating well, I hate this job, this is what's going on. And she's like, okay, well, you know, you just gotta get back on and do your protocol like you know what works for you you know you can't be eating gluten you know you can't be eating fast food you need to be working out you need to be you know taking care of your body and that's kind of like where i realized this isn't like i have to it's just what makes me feel better do i want to do these things that ultimately have me in a better place or do i want to keep doing what i've been doing and then i'm dealing with the eggs and the flare-ups so now when i feel a certain way i know like if i have something that I'm not supposed to eat along with a lot of stress and I see like a little pink or a little rash or a little flare up I'm like I do that to myself like I knew better than this so it's I'm glad that you explained everything to me because now I understand my body like now I'm able to see the alarms go off and pay attention and kind of catch it before I start to you know go backwards and like you said fill up my funnel I'm that's constantly on my mind like if something's wrong, I'm like, okay, my funnel isn't where it's supposed to be and I need to pay attention to that. And that in itself is such a beautiful thing because I think that instead of freaking out at the end, we now understand our bodies and we say, oh, okay, I understand what's going on. So you kind of don't freak out. Instead, you're more like, oh, I know I did that. I know why that happened and I know how to fix it is the great mm -hmm. thing at the end, right? is I know how to fix it. And that's really where you are at now. But that's really the beauty at the end. It's like, you don't freak out actually at the end, but you will freak out in the middle of it. And I know that some of you are freaking out sometimes when those symptoms start to come back or you have a flare because we're actually dealing with one of those layers of your onion. So thank you so much, Yahira. If you guys are interested in taking this journey, the place that you're gonna start is you're gonna meet me. So I do wanna just put a button up in case anybody does wanna book a consultation. Um, in this consultation, we'll meet virtually. I'll hear your story. I'll review your assessment. I'll review your health history and labs. We'll review your journal entries decide what's the best um, package or program for you. I hope that you are leaving today with some hope, if anything. If that's it, I want you guys to see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I want you to see that it is a journey to get there. And at the end, it really can be this beautiful journey that helps you blossom into this person that you always wanted to become. Yahira, I have seen that with you. I have seen you blossom into this confident, beautiful, um, woman like great job and great partner now engaged and like you know your life is what you want you you're designing it right and it's right. now you really have the ability to design it the way you want and you're really at just the beginning of your story now is what i believe i can't wait to see what you do with the life that you now have i'm so excited 
for you. And I'm, I'm so thankful for you sharing your story. I know it's not easy being vulnerable like this and really sharing your story, but um, I hope that everyone here leaves with hope. You guys see that light now and reach out to either of us if you ever need um, to be reminded that of that hope. Everyone have a great Saturday. Yahira, again, thank you so much and congratulations. I am so excited for thank you. you. <laughs> um, and can't wait to see those beautiful pictures from your wedding and all of that when that happens. So, all right, everyone, have a great Saturday and maybe I will meet some of you soon. All right, bye everyone.